All right, so after talking about some of these high-level concepts, let's get a little more tangible. What we're going to do is log back into the uh, accounts that we created last week to see what kind of data we have here. The big one uh, that I want to spend some time on is um, Google Analytics. Uh, that's the one that we often use because it's, it's so powerful. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to log back into Google Analytics, break down all of the data that we have here, and it's a lot of data. So if you weren't here previously, you just need to follow along for the moment. But if you were here last week, what you should do is go ahead and open up your web browser, and we'll go to google.com slash analytics. So google.com slash a-N-A-L-Y-T-I-C-S, Google Analytics. So this is one of the three screens where we would log into to see the data that the two big search engines know about our site. We set up Bing Webmaster Tools, we set up Google Search Console, and we set up Google Analytics. Um, all three of them give you data in different ways but this is the one that is the most thorough. So we'll start with this one. Let's go to google.com slash analytics, and then it'll ask you to sign in. On the top right, you want to click Sign In and select Google Analytics. Sign in with the information you used last week. If you weren't here last week, you could try to go through this process if you'd like, or I would recommend watch the videos first and then go through the process. So if you don't have a Google Analytics, I would just pay attention for the moment instead of trying to set it up because it was a bit of a process. But I'm going to log into the Google Analytics account that I have here. And if you were if you manage to set yours up, you you should log in and if we have any information to look at, it'll make more sense. If you don't have information, I'll be showing you examples from real clients to see what that looks like. Google Analytics and Bing Webmaster Tools um, gather data about the traffic that it sees when people search on their network. So Bing will tell you about what does it see when people are searching on Bing. Google Analytics will tell you what, it, what is it seeing when people search on Google Analytics. So that's why it's valuable to have both set up and to look at both. But um, if you haven't had, if you if you haven't been able to to, lo to log in again, that's okay. Uh, I'm gonna go on here, but as I've said before, because I teach this, but I also do this for a living. Um, I then have access to all of this data of these different clients. You are able to get more people to look at the data. Instead of sharing the same email address, you can let other people view the data. That might be useful because let's say you're in these classes to learn how to do this, to get hired, to do this for clients. And you want to show the client, here's how well it's working since you hired me. So you want to give the client access to see the data, but you don't want to give them your Gmail login. I'll show you how to add more users in a moment. Conceivably, what you could also do this, do with this is other people in your company are also in charge of Twitter. Let's say you and someone else in the company are both on Twitter, and you both need to see, is it working what we're doing on Twitter? So we'd need to log into this to see the result. I need to give more users administrative access. So I've got all of these clients, which the terminology is accounts. I've got all of these folders. These are accounts. And then I've got, in a particular account, I have, um, what do they call them? Their, um, their uh, properties. In each one of these, it would be a property, which is a website or the shopping cart of the website, you know, the website in total, or just the shopping cart, or the YouTube, or whatever. I have different properties in an account. 
And what I can do is give people, other people, access to this data in different ways. If you did manage to log in, go ahead and let's take a quick look here at the admin screen, the admin tab. There's a bunch of settings that you can possibly look at. I'll touch on a few. Um, under admin, the particular account will be listed there. If you've only got one, there's only one. But since I've got multiple to work with, you know, I have all of these to, to work with. Let's say I, I have one of these selected, and I have account column, property column, view column. I have various settings for each one of those different things. Uh, we have, for example, a user management button for each column. The point of this is, in this client, these are the different properties which are getting you know data, gathering data. At this top level, if I go to user management, I can add more people to view the data. And I can add them in different ways. Notice my main account here, I can manage users, edit data, collaborate, read, and analyze. And I can add more people if I add their email right here. I can add them in different roles. So the point of this is to let other people to look at the data. But I have to be careful because if I add more people on this level, they will be able to see the data of all of these sub-items, which I may or may not want them to see. I don't want the other people to also see the YouTube results, just the blog results. So if I add more people here, they'll be able to see everything here and below. If instead, in this property column, and I say, okay, I want the, my collaborator to see the blog data in the blog property, then I'll go to user management. And now I can add people to only see the data of the blog and nothing else. And I can go even deeper to the view. Under view, you can set this up because you're going to gather so much data, you can set it up to show you the data in different views, different screens. And I can further refine it that within a particular view, I can let someone see this data of this website only, not all the data. So for most of you, probably you're going to be giving people access up on the account because you probably don't have as much complication as myself. But keep in mind here that if you need to be detailed and such, which of the columns to go to to put um, to add more users. Um, something that could be useful here under this admin screen, under the view column, it says goals. You may or may not see goals. If you don't see goals, that's most likely because under the main account view, under account settings, is what I said previously. Where did they put it? Not account settings. Somewhere there was the selection. Here it is. If you don't see goals, it might be that under your property column, under property settings, the particular industry that you selected might not have that extra feature. Because you can do so much with Google Analytics and for it to maybe guide you a little easier, some things are deactivated depending on the industry that you chose. So if you don't see that, perhaps change it to other. And usually that one lets you um, see the most features. If you do see goals, what goals is about is to create conversion goals to create uh, sorts of triggers to show something has happened. Let's say 
uh, I've got this website where I sell artwork. Google Analytics can tell me how effectively I'm selling. They can tell me, they can give me a, a percentage of how well I'm actually selling something by setting up a goal. Uh, so if we take a, a look at this, uh, we have new goal and import. I'll look at import in a moment. But under new goal here, I can click new goal. I can cancel this if you don't want to do it, but I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, under, under that new goal, it says, would you like to use a template or would you like to do a, a smart goal if it's available or custom? And the point of all of this is under template, for example, a successful conversion happened when a ticket was bought or the person has registered, or they have bought something, or they've donated. These are some built-in ones, right here and right here, some built-in possible goals that I can help Google Analytics track for me. Uh, I have buy merchandise right there, so I could use it. Continue. Yes? Is this based on your website and having a shop within your website, or does it go out to third party? It could be either or, um, depending how you set it up here, but usually it's going to be on the site here because we've added our tracking code to our site here. If we've got some third-party shopping cart, we need to figure out how to add our Google Analytics tracking code to that one so it can further tell us the data. What I've seen them done is on a thank you page, after they make a purchase, you put that tracking code in, and that's what you will then trigger the Yes, that's what I'm getting to right here. So the way that this works is, okay, how is it smart enough to know someone bought? Well, there has to be a resultant page. So we have here, for example, a destination. If I'm going to buy something, most likely at some point there will be some sort of thank you page or receipt page or transaction results page. So this is how Google Analytics can tell if you really sold something. It's not smart enough that it sees, oh, they press buy and they bought and they put their credit card. It's basically smart enough to see there had to be this path that someone took. There was a page where they saw the product, there was a page where they saw the shopping cart, there was a page where they entered their credit card, and a page where it said, thank you for your purchase. So that's what we're saying here, destination. The name of my goal can be anything. I'm just going to call it maybe, let's say, sales. And I can have many goals saved, so I'm just using goal ID 1 in goal set 1. But I can track a lot of goals. I'm going to say sales, generally, generic sales. And the result, the way that I prove that that happened is that there's a destination. It could be proved by duration, possibly. If my shopping cart, after, you know, five minutes, I bought something, if my shopping cart works that way. Pages per screen, uh, pages and screens per session. We'll talk about sessions definition a little later, but that basically is if this person looked at three pages, that was a successful completion. <coughs> Maybe there was an event, like a, a video that was played. And there's smart goals. Um, this one is also related to AdWords and such. In my case, most likely I'm going to do destination click continue and it says okay you can get you know you can use logic right here but probably equals to will be the right one app screen name or web page so again this is saying for example use my screen for an app and thank you HTML instead of thank you for a web page uh, so if you've got a specific page that everyone gets to eventually when they've bought something. So it was the um, transaction result.html or whatever. The page that everyone gets to once they successfully bought something. It equals to this. And I can get complex with begins with and regular expressions and all of that and case sensitivity. Let's say in this example, it looks like that. I have optional value and funnel. So this is a way for me to assign a value to the conversion. Let's say every time that someone reaches to that transaction screen, it's worth to me $5. 
you can't always set this because you, you're not going to know, depending on your products, how much someone really spent. <clears throat> but sometimes, maybe I'm selling products that are all worth $10, always. So I could set it that whenever someone reaches that page, and the only way to reach transaction result HTML is to actually have bought, I'm going to say, I made a cool $15 off of that. So that's another way for Google to tell you how effective you've been. In theory, you've made $200. Google can tell me that if I set up this goal. A funnel is specifying a path that you expect traffic to take toward the destination. Use it to analyze the entrance and exit points that impact your goal. So this is pretty cool, pretty smart. This is, I'm going to sell something. And I expect people to first visit the menu page, and then click on that product, and then click on buy now, and then click on shop, uh, check out, and such. I can set up you know, these different steps that people are going to go through. They were on this page first, and then this page and this page. Am I going to count this as successful if I set this required or not? So this one can be complex because you don't know what, peop what path people are taking. But the good news is in a moment we'll be able to see under reporting, we'll be able to see that path without us knowing it. We'll be able to see what is the path that people are taking throughout our site. So I don't know how to set this yet, let's say, so I won't. But that's how I can um, see that people are going upon my website as I, as I hope that they do. I can do verify, and if my site has been set up and has existed for a while, this might be accurate or not. I'll click save. I'm sorry, what did you say about the path to the, to the sale? The yeah. path is what, what is what are the pages that I expect people have taken to get to the shopping cart screen? And analytics can tell you yeah. where how many steps that can you go? All of them. When someone visits the site, it can tell you all of the pages they went on. We'll see that under the reporting screen in a moment. Yes? Um, hmm. Did you select a template, first of all, or did you select custom? I did template. Template, OK. Let me do custom. Um, it should. Let me take a quick look. I don't mention if somebody has an ad blocker on, they can block Google Analytics. So, so you're trying to do a custom? Yeah, it's not taking the All right, so this is optional, but it could be very useful to set up these goals. Uh, and I can set up, you know, as many as I want, basically. Um, so I could create another goal and, and set it up in a way that, okay, um, if, uh, if a person did something else upon this page, then that counts as a goal. So instead of me trying to figure out what kind of goal to create, I also have import from gallery. If I go back to the top level here of goals and select import from gallery, these are different uh, goals that people throughout the world have set up and shared with other people on Google Analytics. 
and they can be ordered by what are you trying to accomplish, star ratings, and all of that. As soon as mine loads up, I'll show you, but someone probably already created a way to accomplish the goal that you're trying to do. Uh, so I'm going to say, I want, um, let's say, social. Show me the goals regarding social. Twitter traffic, traffic acquisition from social media. I want to go with highest rating, maybe. So this should show me 15,000 people used this template from April 2014, four stars out of 21, 3,000 people used that one. So these are sort of pre-made goals that someone p created and put it out there for other people to use. Um, so SEO overview keywords not provided, being organic, social networks, LinkedIn. So this is something about setting it up for, this is a flexible dashboard for LinkedIn and for the rest of social networks. So you can uh, look at this on your own. You can select the import and then you'll have that goal attached to your to your site. I'm not going to use one of those goals, uh, but let's say I had um, I had this all set up. Not everyone needs these goals, but if you're able to set one up, then it could be useful because then it'll again help you track more more data. So that that helps you track. As, as you're the webmaster, so you're looking at it, but the person who hired you to build the site actually knows how many sales they're getting because their process is necessary. That's one part of the data. Yes, they can. You can. Uh, you can see that tangibly to see that. Okay, here's their bank account. So it is working. Now, then, this goal here has some value. Uh, to figure out another aspect of it because then we can figure out, okay, they're making sales, but how can we make more sales? We're seeing that there's a speed bump. When they're on this screen to this screen, a lot of people abandon. But if we instead set it up so that they go from this screen to this screen, then they have more success. So this is another tool to help us do better. Uh, so again, there's lots of little things we can look at here. I do recommend that uh, up on the help screen, if you click on help, where do they hide help? Um, you'll be able to look at more, here we go, it's under the gear. There's more help on all of those details. What I want to look at is something more tangibly in, in a moment. But any general questions on what we looked at about goals so far? So you can tell also if they clicked on a page, but then did not decide to buy. That they left, like yes. They left it, they didn't buy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's an abandonment rate that we'll look at. So it'll tell us all of, all of this great detail. So let's actually look at that detail. Usually what you're going to spend time on is this screen up here. Uh, you have home, you have reporting. Click on reporting. Get reporting, you get some charts and stuff, and then um, and then um, on the left, various other screens. Let me set something up here just to show you a client with good amount of data, just to be complete. So those are all the properties for that particular site. Which? The drop down, or did you go to another site? Uh, yeah, it is another site. Uh, that's a, that's a shortcut there. So instead of going back to home, mm -hmm. and then selecting the property here, when you're already in reporting, you can use the that quick shortcut thing at top to jump from from page to page or property to property. <clears throat> so 
let's take a quick look, a quick overview about the anatomy of this screen. You have a lot of screens, a lot of sub items to look at here. You've got your main data over here, and you've got your time horizon right here. This is giving me one month of data. So again, the longer you have this set up, the more accurate your data will be. Because just like the stock market, if you look at stocks in the stock market right here, the stock market is terrible. I lost money. But if you look at it in the longer term, I might have made money. Same thing with analytics. The longer you've got this set up, the better decisions you can make. Because week to week of data, you know, one week of data is such a small amount of data to really make a good decision. I'm doing terrible on Twitter, let me quit Twitter. That's, I wouldn't make that decision in one week, one month. Maybe I would do it in three months, six months. The longer I have it set up and the more I'm trying and I check my results, the better answers I can, I can give the client about what's working. So uh, if, I, if I look at the real time, most of these tabs here that have an overview, but if I look at real time overview, uh, this one would tell me real time if anyone's on my site. Right now, there isn't anyone on my site right now, but within the last 30 minutes, there have been people visiting the site. There is someone on the site now. Uh, so this could be useful. This could be uh, telling me how the traffic is on my site right now. And it's saying, you know, someone in uh, Los Angeles is looking at the site. They're looking at the menu. Someone's hungry. Um, you can look at real-time location and all of that. So there's a lot of screens to look at. But that's one of the interesting ones, real-time. We have audience, acquisition, behavior, and conversions. If you set goals, you will have conversions. If you didn't set goals, you won't have conversions, perhaps. But here, then, we've got audience, acquisition, behavior. If I go back to audience, and look at overview, this is the first screen that I see as soon as I go to the reporting screen. Let's break down what we've got here. In one month, I have all of these sessions. They're also marked down here. In one month, there were 10,000 and a half sessions. You can hover your mouse over many of these things and it'll give you some more info. A session is the period of time a user is actively engaged with your website. So someone visits your site. It's basically a hit, but we don't quite use the term hits anymore because that doesn't really encompass everything that happens. Uh, this is more now what val what's the value of this is that Google is seeing um, someone visited your website and is active, is clicking on things, is scrolling, is actually interacting. That's a session. A little more value than a hit. You've got sessions, 10,477. Users, within this time period there were 8,899, which does count new users and returning users. It can break down new and returning on another chart. And then page views. A person visits a page and sees more than one screen. So you have, that's why often page views is much higher than sessions. Because it's the number of people looking at different screens and such adds up to page views. So about 18 and a half thousand page views. Yes, that does count repeated views of a single page. So if a person went to the menu page and clicked refresh seven times, you got seven page views. It doesn't actually really filter that out. So be careful about that. Pages per session, 1.77. So on average, someone on, with this client visits about two pages when they visit this client. Now the thing about this and many of the data we'll be looking at is people then ask what's good, what's bad? Is my data good, is my data bad? I can't tell you that. I can give you opinions and examples, but think about it this way. One, okay, two pages, rounding up. Clients usually come onto the site and look at two pages, and they usually spend about a minute and a half on this site. For some clients that might be terrible, and for some that might be great. Let me give you an example of, of a good one. This client is a restaurant. What do you usually do on a restaurant website? 
maybe look at the menu, look at the price, maybe order, get directions, and then leave. Maybe you're not going to hang out a lot of time on the, on the site. Maybe you have the order now bookmarked on your browser to quickly go back to that screen. So if a person is really only spending two, two screens on this site, well, it's the, it's the buy and the checkout screens. So for this client, that might not be so bad that people spend two pages at a time. Let's say I'm a blogger and I write a lot of articles on a variety of topics. On that example, perhaps this is terrible. It shows that people are not looking at my pages. They read one article, maybe they read one more, and then they leave. And I've got 20 articles that weren't looked at. So for that one client, this page session, page per session might be terrible. And for another, it might be fine or good. Yes? Is there a way to see which pages are reading? Yes, we'll see that in another screen in a moment. Uh, related to that is pages is duration. People are spending about one and a half minutes. Again, I could probably, if I'm used to the site, come in and go quickly to the buy now, check out, credit card, done. A minute and a half. So maybe in this client, in, it's not so bad that uh, they spend that amount of time. But again, what if I'm a blogger and my articles, you don't really breeze through them in two minutes. It should take you five minutes to read my article, maybe, and I've got many articles for you to read. That could be terrible for that client. People are not sticking around and reading my stuff. Two more right here that also could be terrible or good depending on your company is bounce rate. This is basically that someone visits a page, the definition, um, someone visits a site and leaves without interacting with the page. Someone visits that one page and then they leave, they bounce from that page. That could be bad, that could be good. Again, what if people can quickly get what they need out of this site. They go to a particular page and they leave. It doesn't necessarily mean the home page. What if they have bookmarked the buy now page and they just go to the buy now, click buy and they're done and they leave. That could then have a higher bounce rate. Uh, sometimes people tell you make sure your bounce rate is always under 30 percent. Well yes, but it depends on your business. Uh, if people stay a long time on your site, what if they're spending too long on your site? There's that. What if your site is too complicated and people are spending a lot of time figuring it out? So it may or may not be good to have a good, I mean a high or a low bounce rate. It depends. But what that means is someone visits your site, any page, and then leaves without another, another page. New session duration, uh, new sessions. Are you going to be able to build your business on repeat customers or new customers? And again, I can't answer that. You may be able to have a good business on new customers every time. So this is saying in this time period, one month, 80% of people visiting were new. Is that good or bad? I don't know. It could be good. It could be that we, based on the other data we'll look at, it could be that we had these Twitter campaigns that brought a, brand, a bunch of brand new customers. That's good. A new bunch of new potential customers. If I stretch this out for a longer period of time, if I say show me in a year, then I can make better decisions. So I'm getting a fuller picture within this amount of time. 89,000 visitors, 113,000 hits, um, durations and sessions, and notice that's giving me a better, a clearer picture. And so right here, new and returning visitors, and depending on your business, the purpose of your website, this could be good or bad. Yes? Um, under the language portion online, I have something that's in brackets that says not set. So does the individual set their browser or what language they want to be? By default, the, the web browser no, quote-unquote knows what language you are because it also depends on your operating system. Uh, but a person could change it if they know how. Uh, so the not set could be, you know, like spam bots and uh, 
people that do change it or hide their identity if they're using you know proxies or other blocking software. Uh, so you do see that the not set attribute. What if you see a lot of people from Russia? Uh, unfortunately, I hate to uh, be sweeping, but often that's not so good. If you're seeing a lot of traffic from certain areas and demographics and such that you say, why are they visiting me? Probably it's bad traffic. It's probably spam traffic or, or you know, not relevant traffic because this particular client in one month had 254 hits from Russia. Well, this client doesn't ship food to Russia, so that's probably spam. That's probably spam um, traffic. So that's why it's valuable for us to look at this. Uh, when we, I mentioned last week, this is a tool as well as Bing to tell us where's our traffic coming from and to deal with the good traffic to help us get more good traffic and to deal with the bad traffic because bad traffic could weigh you down also. We'll get to that in a moment. But here, yes? So you've got Spain, so I'm in Spanish, you've got segmented into various... Uh, Dialects of Spanish. What's 419? Is that an error code? Well, ES, first of all, is Spanish, so someone is visiting the site and their language is set to a version, a dialect of Spanish. Mm -hmm. I'd have to look it up where Span, from where what Spanish that is. It's, um, it's language and country, so like the Spanish U.S. Yes, but 419. Yeah, yeah, we'd have to look that up. Yes, we're going to look at all of this stuff in one moment. But uh, yes, it's going to tell you uh, the region. For example, there's Espanol from Mexico. So Mexican Spanish, because it's different than Spanish Spanish. And it's also different from Excel. I have to look that one up. Um, but obviously ENUS is you know American English, because there's also British English, Australian English, etc. So this, the value about this is seeing I'm trying to reach a certain demographic and I'm succeeding. I am reaching, it is a Mexican food, but it's a restaurant in the U.S., so I would assume that most of the traffic I get are English speakers because I'm targeting in the U.S. I can further see the details under country. So I'm seeing most traffic in this month is from the U.S. And then third place traffic is Russia, which again is probably a bunch of spam traffic. And I'll be able to see exactly where that traffic's coming from, and we'll talk about how to deal with it. We're getting traffic from Australia. That You may think, well, that's uh, spam. But actually, Australia is pretty well known for their lamb. And this is lamb barbecue uh, food. So that might not be bad traffic. Not that we're going to ship the, the food to Australia, but we're at least getting traffic from those that really might care. City. In this particular client, this is pretty valuable because this client started in Tijuana in 1990, built a restaurant in San Diego in 2008, and then built one in Los Angeles in 2015. And now it shows here that more traffic is coming from Los Angeles to the website than San Diego. So that then tells us, okay, we probably need to focus our efforts of SEO to start targeting Los Angeles more or being active on Twitter to a Los Angeles audience. Not to say we're going to abandon San Diego Chula Vista, but we're seeing that more traffic is now coming to the website from LA, so I better have a, a good website that appeals to LA demographics. The food is Mexico City style, lamb barbecue, so there's some traffic coming from Mexico City. And what we can do with some of this stuff, let's say operating system. Most of the traffic seems to be coming from Android, so people on their Android phones visiting the site. I never knew that. I thought it was people on their laptops. Well, now I'm seeing here, most people are coming from Android. Second place is iPhone. Number one, then, combined, is a lot of traffic coming from mobile. So the search engines now are really saying your site needs to be mobile. This is obviously one bit of anecdotal data, but I can show you from all of the other clients, they're also often having more traffic from mobile. And the search engines themselves are telling you, you should have a mobile site. If your site doesn't look good on a mobile device, you're losing traffic. 
because the search engines are also not going to rank you as well. Why would the search engine show a website that's hard to manage on mobile? And so if your website, have you visited a website on your mobile and the text looks tiny, you have to zoom in, most likely then that means the site is not mobile. So if your website doesn't look good on a mobile, if I've got to zoom in, it's most likely not mobile friendly. The keyword is also responsive web design. If your website doesn't have responsive web design, that could be detrimental to your traffic. Next we've got Windows computers, Mac computers, Chrome computers, Linux, Windows Phone, Blackberry, there's still a few of them. 11 hits, not set in Mott. I don't know what that is, maybe Motorola, Android phone or something. The point of this is, okay, it's good information, but if you are able to program this into your site or buy an app, you can use this to your advantage. Let me give you a negative example. Don't do this. I read an article a few years ago that some travel website, it was discovered that people that were visiting um, the site on the Safari web browser, the prices were higher than those visiting in Firefox or Chrome or Internet Explorer. Now, who often, by default, uses Safari web browser? Mac people. People are using Apple computers. So they reasoned, if people are rich enough to have a Mac, then they're rich enough to pay a little bit more for our hotel prices. So if you're visiting their site on Safari, your, your, your hotels were more expensive. Well, that was discovered. It was brought to the attention of the company, and the company was like, oh, okay, there was a problem in our programming, we'll fix it, sorry. Clearly, they were doing it on purpose. Because you can see this data. Now, that's a negative example, of course. Positive example. Um, I'm seeing here that more people are starting to use Edge, Microsoft Edge, which is the successor to Internet Explorer. So at a certain point, there was zero traffic from Edge. Now it's increasing. The point of this is, I could possibly get a programmer to program my site to detect that. I could possibly buy an app or find a plugin to detect that. And in a positive way, then say, maybe make a pop up appear. Because the website can detect someone's visiting on Edge. And I'm seeing here, I'm getting traffic from Edge. And my website can make a pop up appear that says, Welcome, Microsoft Edge user. For the next one hour, get 10% off to entice people to come back more if I know who's visiting my site. I'm getting a lot of traffic from Chrome users, which is then corroborated with the operating system, which is Android. You've got, you've got Chrome on Android. I'm seeing Safari comes next, Safari in-app. That one usually means that someone is in one app and then loads Safari to see something else. For example, People are on Facebook. They're on, the, they're on this client's Facebook page. And they can click to open Safari inside of Facebook and order. They can order, the, order food. Some people are visiting from Amazon Silk, which is, you know, Kindle and all of that. So the point of this is that, and it's not, it's not easy. I'm just touching upon it, but if you research, you know, this detection, browser detection, location detection. You can look that up and maybe add that feature to your site so that when it detects, someone visiting my site on that Blackberry, I'm going to give them a break and give them 10% off uh, when they visit my site. So maybe more Blackberry people will come and visit the site. I can detect service provider. So the most people are visiting on Time Warner then T-Mobile, Cox, etc. Uninet from Mexico City is in 10th place. Mobile operating system, majority is Android, very close second is iOS, and then everything else is a distant third. Some Windows phone users, one person still hanging on to their 10-year-old Nokia phone, Symbian OS. Um, service provider there. T-Mobile is the most popular mobile provider. 
I've been in the business of web design, I guess now 15 years, and uh, the thing always was, how do we design a site that looks good on people's monitors? People's monitors were very homogenous for a long time. Everyone had a 14-inch monitor, and then an explosion and more, more sizes. So then it was a challenge, what size and layout should I use for my, for my site? And people still ask that, how big should I make my fonts, or what alignment should I use and all of that? And it's not an easy answer to give because there's so many monitors, even these little guys in our pockets. So this screen here helps you answer that. The majority of people visiting this client on a mobile device are using a pretty low-end device. Anything above 720 is considered HD quality. Number one is not HD. Neither is two or three. Number four, fourth place, is starting to approach HD quality phones. Then fifth place and then sixth place. But the majority of people visiting this client are not using HD phones, meaning are not using the latest high quality phone. Um, this is in the section of mobile. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Although some of these dimensions do apply to some monitors, like 720 by 1280 could be a real monitor, but that's nowadays starting to be uh, an HD phone, you know, like a 6-inch phone, 5-inch phone and such. These smaller 4-inch ones are usually the ones that are smaller. Because they the pixels. And yeah, they're very high quality. You know, the marketing gimmick behind the retina screen on the Mac just means it's got more pixels. It's higher quality. Yes? I just want to go back to the demographics. Sure. My biggest one is like not seven. For some reason, they are using some sort of, you know, cloaking software or they're using, or they don't have it set on their computer. Uh, something has happened so that it doesn't show that information. They might be under private mode. You know how on these web browsers you can go up to uh, you know incognito mode, private mode, whatever. That could go toward that. They could be... That could also be the case as well. Um, so if it's not set, it's not bad that it's not set. I'm still gonna take second place or whatever like when I'm looking over at service provider not set is number one. I'm just going to ignore it even though it's most of the traffic, but a real provider then is T-Mobile. I can work with that. Now that's a known quantity. I'm not going to worry about the not set because it's not set. It's not detrimental that people are visiting with not set. It's just that I don't see that data. Yes? So T-Mobile has a good package with Mexico and the mm -hmm. U.S., right? So yeah. Mm -hmm. I could account for that, yeah. And then once I know that, what I could do is I could I don't even have to do very complex here on my web on programming. I could go to the home page of this site and say T-Mobile customers click here. And then they click there and through other setup I can then do something about extra sales or coupons or whatever for T-Mobile people. So once I know this stuff, I can do something about it. This is one of many screens of data to look at. Let's move on and look at some more. But any questions? Last questions on this screen? Most of these screens, uh, there's a little mortar board here, one of these little graduation caps. If, if you see like this extra screen of stuff, this is more, this is analytics education, because there's so much to look at and learn. You can teach a whole class on Google Analytics for four weeks. But you can educate yourself here. If you see the little graduation cap, the mortar board, uh, you can click there and it'll explain what these different things are, little videos and more help. This is under the section of audience. Who are the people visiting your site? You can go further into other things. Let's see what's interesting. If we go look at demographics overview, it may or may not. Some of these screens you may or may not have just because, again, I've set this up and I've had it set up for a while. If you go to Demographics Overview and it says, please activate this feature, you can look at that on your own and activate it. But if you do activate some of these deeper features, it'll tell you like this. It tells me that um, 
the majority of people visiting this particular client are male, 55 to 44, within these age ranges, 35, well, 25 to 44 year olds, and then drops down and, and so forth. How does it know all of that? Well, every time you're logged into your Gmail and when you're using Google Plus and, you know, when you're visiting this site and that site and this site and it's keeping track of your cookies and all of that, on the one hand, it's annoying and scary that these things know so much about us, but on the other hand, this is great for us as a business. This is what marketing is. This is what marketing firms kill for, to know this. You know, in a real-world marketing firm, never mind all this online stuff, this, this would be golden for the classic marketing companies. How do I know who cares about this brand? I'm trying to sell this brand of bottled water, and who's going to want it since there's already so many competitors? Well, I need to know their ages and, and, and uh, genders and all of that, and we get all of this for free out of Google Analytics and Bing as well. We get a version of this out of Bing. We're just looking at analytics because it's such a the big famous one. Um, again, you might not see all of these things, for example, interests. Again, if it asks you, activate this feature, take a moment at some point to activate it. Because look at this, this will tell me, people that are visiting this client are movie lovers. How does it know that? We give away so much information online, consciously and subconsciously. If I'm logged into Gmail, and I went to Hulu, and I went to tvguide.com, and I went to Amazon and bought a DVD, it's gaining information about me that probably I like movies. The fourth place is cooking enthusiasts, and entertainment, and all of that. Technophiles, yes? I have a message in my Mm -hmm. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. Uh, maybe during the break I can look over there to see if there's any more info. But uh, the, the thing about thresholds and such is we need minimal amounts of traffic oftentimes. So if, if I'm not getting very many hits in general, like this one's getting uh, 8,000 per 8,000 users per month or so. If, if you're getting it much lower than that, then it can't fully create a good picture of data for you because it's just not enough data as a minimal threshold. So, other categories, news and weather. So, this is who is visiting the site in various aspects, geographically, Again, we can look at language and location, behavior, new versus returning. Break it down to show me my new visitors and returning visitors. Okay, this won't exactly tell you every, it would be great if it could tell you every single person that visited your site, but that's much more complicated. Under returning visitor, you know, it tells me that within this amount of time, returning visitors here since I also have a conversion set up approximately 1% actually complete this goal which for this client is booking a table so out of this amount of time we had about 1% success rate of booking a table If you look at user flow, this is the screen that tells you what was the, what were the, where did the person go throughout my site? This is under uh, audience and it's under the last one, user flow. So this shows. Most of the traffic's coming from the U.S., and they mostly, so these are all proportional sizes, they mostly go straight to the home page. The slash is the home page. Most of them go directly to the home page. There's some amount of drop-off there, people that leave. You can hover over and it tells you more info. But most of the time when people go to the home page, then they go to view the menu. 
Some amount go over to book a table. Some of them go over to uh, choose your location. And then there's other pages. So then after someone visits view menu, there's some drop off there. And then some go back to the main home screen and some go back over to reservation and contact and book, etc. So you can zoom in. There's a zoom in button right here to see even more data, more detail that is. And this screen can get very, you know, very big. But here you can see the general path of people and the drop-off and everything. This can then help me to uh, figure out if I'm if I'm being effective on my site. In general, the rule is try to get people to accomplish their goal within three clicks. Think about yourself. You visit a website and when do you get frustrated? It's usually after you've clicked to this screen and that screen, you know, four times, five times, I'm lost, forget it, I'll go elsewhere. So if you can try to get your goal accomplished, if the user can accomplish their goal within three clicks, you can make a sale within the third click, or donate or whatever within three clicks, that could be very valuable. How do you use this with your clients? Are, are you sending them little reports once a month? Or you see them there? Yeah, it's going to depend on the client. For us, we go in and usually over the, on the overview, we compile the overview because we can export this into a PDF. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can go into the thing is that all of these screens you would need to export. It's the, not the whole thing because it's be like the, the thing that thick. Uh, but to the important screens, you could go in and export it, and then with the client say, okay, within this amount of time, look at how we, how many more hits we got, and look at how much this compared to last month, because you can do also comparisons up here. If you go up to the time horizon and you say compare to the previous month, then you can say, last month you didn't do this, and this month we did this, and look at the results. More people visited this page that we promoted more on Facebook. So if you were posting, I don't know, pictures of food, like on Instagram, that were like really you know, cool pictures, and then they click through to his site to see more about the restaurant, you'd be able to see that Instagram. Yeah, that traffic from Instagram. That's on another screen that we're going to look at here. So that's how you're, you can tell how effective you are. All of these networks, Twitter, Instagram, and such, are going to tell you some amount of statistics, but usually they can only tell you within their network. They can only tell you, I had so many visits and so many hits and so many likes on Instagram, but then the next step of it, it can't tell you, Instagram can't tell you, can't report to you what someone did on your site, because its power ends when you leave Instagram. But can it tell you what it people clicked on, on, because on Instagram, don't you can have the, uh, the website link, right? Mm -hmm. So can it tell you that that is clicked on? On Instagram, um, I don't remember what the latest, because they've been changing it recently, I don't remember if it tells you that deeply. I know that it tells you your most viewed, uh, your most viewed pictures and, and all of that, but I'm not sure if it tells you if the link was clicked. But you can see the opposite side of that here. We will see here that we can we can see where's our traffic coming from. So what exactly is the overview then? Is it this? <coughs> well, each one of these sections, we're going to look at acquisition in a moment, has an overview. Because there's so much data that you can get into deeply that they all have an overview. Let's look at this next one here, Acquisition Overview. Acquisition, this is the screen that tells us where did we get our traffic from. Audience is who is our traffic. Acquisition, where did we get our traffic. And behavior, what did they do on our site. More detail about the different pages they looked at and such. But acquisition, where did I get my traffic from. 
On the overview, I get some nice charts that say uh, organic search 47%, direct traffic 28%, social 16 and then exactly how many. And then we've got referrals. So the thing is that organic search is someone goes on Google, they type keywords, they find the client and they click. So that was an acquisition from a Google search, for an organic Google search. You might see other ones here if you also did pay per click. If you paid, it'll tell you that. If you've also done email campaigns, it'll tell you that. So in this case, most traffic comes from people searching. Is that good or bad? I don't know. It depends on your company. It depends on your efforts. If you're spending a lot of try time trying to do SEO, this might be good. Most of the traffic is coming from people searching, and we're trying to engage in SEO, search engine optimization. I'm going to get to that. So organic search is search from a search engine. Then we've got direct. Well, that's when someone has, for example, the shopping cart bookmarked on their site, on their web browser, and they go directly to the page. Or they have the link, they got the link somewhere, and put the link into their browser and went to the page directly. So direct traffic. There's a good amount of traffic to this client that goes directly to the page in question. Social is pretty obvious, traffic from social media. And we can break down exactly from Facebook, from Instagram, etc. And referral is traffic from another website. You get referred from another website. So let's say on some other website, a food blogging website, wrote an article about this client, free traffic from that other client, uh, from that other website, referral traffic. We're going to see how valuable this is in a moment after our break because I've got a new handout for you. Again, I want to know my backlinks. I'll talk about that concept after the break, but I want to know who is linking to my site what other sites are linking to my site, and what do I do with the good links, and what do I do with the bad links. <coughs> I had here a goal set up, and we're seeing about um, book a table from San Diego, the positive conversion within this time period. I might be interested here under referral. If I click referral, it goes down deeper. Because we've got acquisition, overview, traffic, referrals. And then this client it's telling me right here traffic from Facebook, from something called Rank Checker Online, from Yelp, Eater. Uh, Mobile Facebook, LA Times. Is, is Twitter? Yes, that's uh, Twitter's link shortening system. Um, some traffic from 91X. So we'll take a break and then we'll talk about, okay, I'm learning so much, how do I use it, what, what does it mean? The, the big value is this screen here, one of the big, it's all valuable, one of the big screens of value is here, acquisitions, all traffic referrals. I want to know what are these other pages, these other sites that are linking to my site. And once I know what the good ones are, what to do about it, and the bad ones, what to do about it, because bad links, all those links from Russian sites could be hurting your SEO unfortunately. So we'll talk about how to deal with that. I'm going to put a handout in the folder, so if you'd like to print it during the break, you can. Let me pull up this other handout. <coughs> you go back to the network folder, I just added a new handout there called Campus SEO number 3 backlinks. 
We're going to take a break. It's 2.53. We'll be back at 2.53. Uh, and then uh, if you'd like to print during the break, you can. We still have more to talk about analytics, and we'll do so after the break.